So if I said India, most of you would get an image or a taste or maybe some ideas about what life in India is like. Some of you might have been to India. And so the story starts with your own stories that you bring to that story. And part of tonight that's really interesting in terms of history and history is that you can never not hear a story once you've heard it. And so our stories now become your stories and your stories weave their way in. And that was part of what the fascination was for me in trying to find a story. And so I decided that I would tell a story that I use sometimes in my teaching that comes from Rishikesh. And Rishikesh is in the foothills of the Himalayas. And it is a town that is a pilgrim town and for Indian people, for Hindu people, because the Ganges River runs through it. But it is also a major yoga centre for Western yogis. And so you get this incredible crossover of Indian life and Westerners. And not always in a healthy way, but sometimes in a healthy way. So if you can imagine a road, and this road winds up from Rishikesh town and up through a place called Lakshmanjula, and then heads off into the villages. And a road in India is a sight to see, because... If you can get past the potholes, there are cows, there are trucks, there are bicycles, there are motorbikes, there are people, there's life on the road. And, and the road goes to sleep a little bit at night, but about 4.30, right where I was staying, you would hear a truck horn. Now, horns in India are not like normal horns, they don't just go beep beep. They go... On every corner, just in case there's a cow or a person or a bike or a, or a whatever. So, so about 4.30 in the morning, about two kilometres down the road, you would hear the first corner. Da, 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 and I'd be like, oh, really? Da, 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 da. And it would get to the kind of ground-shaking version just at my corner. So that road had the local buses that would arrive. And the local buses were the sort that if you were brave as a Westerner, you took. If you were silly as a Westerner, you took. Um, So generally, you didn't take them. And I was standing at the organic shop, which is another melting pot in Rishikesh. And I was standing with the owner of of this uh, organic shop. And we have a funny relationship. So if you think 1.3 billion people in India, and I am at the Taj Mahal with a group of my yoga students because even though there's not much yoga at the Taj Mahal, you still have to go to the Taj Mahal when you're in India. And I'm standing at the Taj, and this man kind of walks past me, looks at me, and he turns back and goes, I know you. And I went, oh my goodness, and he goes, and it was the owner of the organic shop from Rishikesh. 460-something kilometres away from Rishikesh, on holiday with his family, seeing me there. So... So back in Rishikesh sometime later, we're standing kind of reminiscing about how hilarious it is that you can bump into people at the Taj Mahal. And the local bus pulled in from one of the villages up the way. And out come the people. And there is a beauty to India that if if we look around tonight when the lights are up, you will notice that there's a lot of black in the room. In India, black is pink. So there's a lot of pink in India. So you'll be driving along or riding along and you'll see pink in the fields because the women wear the most fantastic bright pink and red and orange saris. And so when the local people got off the bus, there was a particular group that caught our eye. And we went very, very quiet because the ladies got off in their bare feet. And so you can tell immediately that there's not a lot of money for these people but with their beautiful anklets around their ankles. And they got off, and then a young man got off carrying a bundle draped in pink. And my heart went, and it still does it now, and I thought, oh my goodness, because she was skeletal, and she was tiny, and she was wrapped in this sari. And you could tell that it wasn't days that this lady had left. It was probably hours. And she got... She was wrapped up with either her grandson, maybe her great-grandson. And they got down off the bus and her face split into the most incredible smile I had ever seen. It just lit because she was in Rishikesh and the Ganges River was about 200 metres away. So in India, for those that might not know, the Ganges is the most sacred river. There's three sacred rivers, but the Ganga is the one that 
if you're going to die in India, you want to die beside it. And you will do anything to do that. And it looked like they had done everything to get her there. And so I knew that, and the owner of the organic shop knew that, and so we bowed as this family went past us. And then I turned, and he touched my arm, which is quite unusual for an Indian man to do, but it was to make me notice that the Brahmin priest from the 17th story, it's quite spectacular, um, Shiva temple that was just along, was running. Now, there are, and, and those of you that I've come from Catholicism back in the day, and you know there is the priest that can do the Latin in 30 seconds flat, or maybe 15 minutes, and then absolve you, and then he's off to the next one. And then there's the one that's fire and brimstone and passionate and beautiful. It's the same in India. You get the Brahmin priest that can intone a blessing upon you, and those that are about to go to India will have those kind of blessings. Fast enough to get your rupees and then go to the next person, because it's very important. This was not one of those Brahmin priests. He was running because he had seen that Ma was dying. And he ran, and he ran with all of the accoutrements kind of attached for his craft, starting to pray before they'd even kind of dazed and confused got off the bus. And he herded the whole family up to this temple because he knew that she wanted to do every floor, all 17 floors, all of the gods, to get down to Ganga. And I just stood there, and I can remember thinking, I'm never going to forget this, which I haven't. But also, that was one of the beautiful kind of moments in India where you realise that for all of the chaos, there is this beauty about that river. And how the river weaves in with stories is that to bathe in the river is, in Western terms you'll often hear, will wash your sin away. Sin has got a very different concept in India. Sin is stories. It will wash your stories away. Because Ganga will not wash them away. She will hold them because you can't anymore. And so when you wash in the Ganga, the Ganga takes your stories and she holds them. She is the goddess that holds those stories. And the first person that told me that was a man who I was myself really sick at the time. Not sick like this woman, but sick enough. And I had gone down to the river to sit and watch the world go past. And he came down and he was in the most pristine white shirt And in India, I have no idea how you get a shirt that white. When you've been to India, you'll understand that there's just dust. Like, don't take anything white to India. Um, It just doesn't come back white. Pristine white shirt, black trousers, taking his shoes off and rolling his trousers up. And he had plastic bottles because they collect the water um, for their sacred practices from the Ganga. And he washed, and then he looked at me, and then he gave me the look that some people give you when they know that there's something needs to be said. And he said to me, he said, Ganga will take all stories and hold them so that when you need to remember them, they're there. And I thought, wow, that's a really beautiful way of translating that. And isn't that much nicer than she'll wash away your sins? No, she'll hold them for you. So when you need to remember them, they're there. And that is kind of what stories do. They hold us in place and they hold us in time and they become part of our history and her story along the way. But for me, the power is not just in that, but that in Ganga now has that woman's story. But her story has travelled, I calculated today, 25,000 kilometres since then. It's been told in LA. It's been told here in New Zealand. It's been told up in Fairbanks in Alaska. And now it's been told here tonight. And so her story is held in a whole different place now. And sadly, she will never know how much she touched and her sons touched me that day. Like Ganga knows. So thank you all and thank you Kenny for organising. Namaskar.